Irrationality and irrationality are different concepts, and it's worth knowing the difference and how they relate. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about definitions of each of them, some examples of each of them, how they relate to each other, and then how economists approach modeling each of them. So irrationality is something that's instinctive or non-deliberative. So if you've read this book, which anyone interested in behavioral economics should, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. He talks about System 1 and System 2 thinking, where System 1 is automatic thinking that's oftentimes below the level of consciousness. You can't really turn it off. It's something that happens instinctively. And System 1 thinking relates to irrationality. System 2 thinking is deliberative thinking where you're kind of weighing different decisions. If we have agency, the agency is going to come through system two thinking. So what would an irrational decision be? Well, I mean, when I first think of irrational decisions, I think of dogs or animals where most decisions the dog makes throughout the day are going to be irrational. The dog's not deliberating. The dog is just sort of going where he feels like going, eating what he feels like eating, chasing what he feels like chasing. All of those are irrational decisions made by the dog. Um, now, when we think about people, um, those decisions might be more controversial, but when I think of myself, I think of how many potato chips do I eat from the bag of potato chips between the grocery store and my house. So it might be a deliberative decision about whether to open the bag of uh, potato chips and put them in the seat next to me. That one might be something I think through. But if the bag of potato chips is sitting there open and I'm driving, I just eat them and the decision about how many to eat is irrational. I'm fairly certain in my case that's irrational because it really is just sort of instinctive. I'm doing it without thinking about it. Other irrational decisions in humans, well, if someone pulls a gun on you, do you freeze or do you run away? Um, likely that's going to be an irrational decision and it may be trained based on your past experiences. I think the decision of a tennis player about whether or not to move right or move left when their opponent hits the ball, that's probably an irrational decision. Now, it's a well-trained irrational decision if they've spent a lot of time on the courts with coaches helping them improve their skills. Um, as a matter of fact, I think in sports, a lot of times the coach's job is to train the instincts of players enough so that when these split-second decisions have to be made on the field, they've already been made during practice. They've already been made in the way the person has trained their irrational process of interacting with that game. Other irrational decisions. Um, when an attractive person looks at you, do you smile back at them or do you look down um, and cower? Your reaction to that is probably irrational. It's probably going to happen without you really deliberatively thinking about it. And like many or most irrational decisions, it probably depends on the accumulated experience you have in the past of positive and negative experiences in both of those cases. In terms of future science, brain scanning technology can sometimes tell us if a decision is irrational or, or rational because a lot of times the brain scans can tell when you've made a decision before you even say what that decision is. Um, so that's probably a science that has a ways to go in the future but will be an interesting field of study moving forward, which is irrational decisions. So if that's irrational, then what is irrational? Um, now, Irrational is actually a whole bag of worms, so much so that I will probably spend another video, a different video, going into depth about what exactly irrationality means, because there's actually different definitions of irrationality, um, but here I'd just like to give you a few uh, possible definitions to give you a sense for what irrationality is and how it contrasts with irrationality. Irrationality is something that's counter to rationality against rationality, in which case we have to ask, what is rationality? Some people will use the classic definition that microeconomists use, in which case you can define rationality as pursuing enlightened self-interest. And each of those components, whether you're actually pursuing it, whether it's enlightened, whether you have good information going into that, and self-interest, 
um, is self-explanatory, but you can go into detail about each of those things. And of course, if that's rationality, then a rationality is going to violate one of those principles. That's one definition. Another definition of irrationality is something that is against your own self-interest. And some people will argue it's not possible to make decisions that are against your own self-interest. But if you end up regretting a decision you made, that could be indication that it was against your self-interest somehow. And it's worth noting that irrationality doesn't necessarily mean bad decision. For example, I mean, under some definitions of irrationality, altruistic behavior that's kind to others could be considered irrational, but obviously that's a good good behavior. So irrationality doesn't have to do with good or bad, it just has to do with is it in your self-interest and is it is it a decision that's well made in your self-interest. And classic examples of irrational decisions include not saving enough for retirement and regretting that, being too fearful and letting fear of loss or fear of failure drive your life too much, Things like that are in the irrational decision category. I tend to think that regret is one of the key components of irrational behavior, that you make a decision and then after you make the decision you realize that's not good for you, that's an indication that there's some kind of tension there that happened when you made the decision. But irrationality is actually super, super complex. Now what's the relationship between irrationality and irrationality? It's possible for an irrational decision to be irrational, obviously, but it's also possible for an irrational decision to be rational. I mean, if you think about the sports example, I think you can see that that's clear, that you can, um, you can have an irrational response that's just sort of clamming up whenever the ball comes near you, you're imagining a soccer game, and someone kicks the ball near you, and instead of kicking it back, you your reaction is to hide from the ball, that would be an irrational decision. It's not gonna serve you well. It's also an irrational decision, it's instinctive. But of course, a really well-trained soccer player is going to have irrational decision responses that are very rational, that are the best possible way of playing that game. So um, it's possible to have both irrational and rational, irrational decisions. Now, how do economists model each of these two things? Well, um, the whole field of behavioral economics is basically about modeling irrational decisions. So there's lots of different ways we approach that. Um, we build loss aversion coefficients in if people are consistently uh, more averse to bad things than, than they love good things. We can um, adjust our time discounting model to account for procrastination. That's um, so we can basically build myopia into our models. There's basically a whole tool set that behavioral economics gives us for building irrational decisions into our models. Um, and so, if you want to know the answer, how do economists model irrationality? go take a behavioral economics course. How do economists model irrationality? And the answer is it's really the same way we model everything else, which is that there's costs and benefits, and those costs and benefits are the accumulation of our past experience, which creates certain feelings in us that cause that reaction. So for this one, I like to use the example of a dog that's let outside and it runs around in circles in the yard. So, um, what what's the decision about how many times to run around the yard before stopping that that dog makes? And of course, this dog is irrational in making that decision. I think we can all agree on that. Well, um, there's benefits to running around the yard. The benefits are the smells, the exhilaration, the fun of running around the yard, the times that the dog gets to run by its favorite tree. Um, so there's benefits for each round around the yard. Those benefits are diminishing because you've smelled the yard once. Um, the value to the dog of smelling the yard a second time is of course going to be less. And then there's costs to running around the yard. There's effort costs. The dog's effort energy is going to be diminished as the dog runs around the yard more. And there might be other costs as well. But you could model those, increasing marginal costs, diminishing marginal benefit. Those things apply to that dog's decision about how many times to run around the yard. 
And that is an irrational model where the decision is still instinctive, but it's, it's informed by your past experience of benefit and cost. And that's how we model irrational decisions. So irrational and irrational are different concepts. They're both useful. Economists can model both of them. And you need a whole behavioral economics course to think about irrationality and to model it. Irrationality, we can still model that. We just need to be a little bit open-minded about the costs and benefits.